Hare Krishna. Hare. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And so today we'll be speaking on the topic of the power of self-acceptance. I'll talk based on a contrast between the life and character of Dhritarashtra and Vidura. Am I audible behind? Okay. So, in some ways, life is like a card game. And when you play cards, we all get a hand in the beginning. Now, some people get a good hand, some people get a bad hand. Now, the hand that you get, you could say it's chance, it's luck, whatever it is, that's what you got. And after that, how you play your hand, that is where your expertise comes in. So for all of us, we get a hand at life. At the start of our life itself, we get some kind of hand. And in some ways it is good, some ways it is bad. So actually speaking, everybody, the hand that they get is bad in some ways. For some people, it may not look bad. Last several years, I have been spending almost uh, six to eight months outside India, especially in America. And in India, we think America is a very prosperous, wealthy, it's like a dream land. In fact, when I completed my studies in engineering, I was supposed to go to America. But I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, so I decided not to go. And then maybe 20 years later, I went as a Bhagavad speaker. So, and after that, when I came back, all my relatives who had been very disappointed with me when I didn't go to America for higher studies, they said, now your life is successful. You went to America. No? <laughs> so, the point is that actually, we think America is a wonderful place. Now, yes, at a material level, in terms of physical facilities and physical prosperity, it's, it's good. It's much, much better than India. But there is something called there is, you know, we talk about wealth in terms of financial wealth, but there is also social capital. Social capital means that the kind of relationships that we have, the kind of family and community support that we have. And that is criminally lacking. The people are extremely lonely. Even small children, they, the parents don't have time for them. If the parents have time, they don't know how to deal with their children. It's, it's, Neither can children relate to parents, nor can uh, spouses relate to each other. It's a very lonely society. The point here, I'm not saying to trash America. The point is that people in America get a different kind of car. And in India, you get a different kind of car. Normally, if you meet a college student, one of the things you ask is, okay, what do you do? Where do you come from? Who, what do your parents do? So I was told that this, it is not proper in an American college to ask students where, what do your parents do? Why? Because often there is a, quite a sad story behind it. Many of them are separated and it brings up painful memories for them. They say better, unless they talk about it, don't talk about it. Now what is the normal, just a social inquiry, it's considered impolite over there. So everybody gets a particular hand. And now we all need to firstly accept the hand that we have. And then, we play it as well as we can. But if we refuse to accept the hand itself, and we resent the hand, then it becomes almost impossible to play it well. So I talk about Dhritarashtra and Vidura, and we'll draw some parallels from there in our lives. So both of them, at one level, got a bad hand. What was the bad hand that Dhritarashtra got? Yes, he was born blind, without a face. And what was the bad hand that Vidura got? Dasiputra. Sorry? Dasiputra. He was, he was a maid servant's child, maid servant's son. So although in one sense he was born from a royal father, because there is not a royal mother. So, although he was born in that family, right from birth itself, he was deprived of the opportunity to uh, inherit the kingdom. So, in general life, everybody gets a bad hand. 
some way or the other. Now, after they get the bad hand, what do they do? So, if we look at Dhritarashtra, what happened is, he could never accept that I can't be the king. And he was always craving, can I somehow become the king? And eventually, if I can't become the king, my son must become the king. Now, this desire at one level is natural. If anything desirable is available for us, we will naturally want it. If we don't get it, we may want our loved ones to get it. So, the desire itself is not bad. In any situation that we are in life, we all want to progress naturally. Say, if we are in a job, we would like to get promotion. If we are staying in a particular house, we want a bigger house. That's, that's the desire to progress is natural. However, if that desire makes us lose sense of dharma, lose sense of what is right or wrong, now, if one desire becomes everything for us, then it becomes what is called an obsession. And obsession is dangerous. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 7th chapter, 10th verse, Dharma aviruddha bhutosh bhuteshu kamo smibha darshava. This kam refers generically to desire. We all have desires. But our desires, our ambitions, the ambitions should not cross over the line of dharma. Now when ambition, say, goes beyond ethics, then it becomes greed. Ambition is natural for everyone. But when the ambition makes us cut ethical corners and do wrong things, then that is greed, that is destructive. So the Dhrashtra's ambition at one level was natural. But his ambition, his aspiration, it made him lose perspective. Lose perspective. It's a very striking that you know, when we look at the world, we don't look at the world as it is. Basically, the world is extremely complicated. Right? I was in Massachusetts University and there they are working on artificial intelligence. So I was talking, I gave a talk on science and spirituality over there. And after that, I was talking to one of the professors. So, MIT in America is a He's a pioneer in artificial intelligence right now. So they said one problem with designing artificially intelligent <coughs> robots. Now we have a lot of things which, are, which do a lot of lot of machines which do a lot of things which earlier are not possible. But a vision is a very complicated thing. Because when we perceive things, so right now you're sitting in this room, if I ask you, how many chairs are in this room? In this room? <coughs> Some of my say. Now, you are not really concerned how many chairs are there in terms of the count. You are concerned, is there a chair for me to sit? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so, there is knowledge of matter and there is knowledge of what matters. Knowledge of matter is how many chairs are there in this room. Knowledge of what matters is, is there a chair for me? So now, of course, if you consider the organizers over here, they will need to have proper planning. Okay. We have got maybe 120 chairs. Or uh, uh, maybe more people come. Then you might need to get more chairs. Do we have a stock? So basically when you come into the room, you don't enter and start counting how many chairs are there. It's like, where do you want to sit? Is there a chair where you can sit? So when we, that the same principle applies to the world at large. The world is so complicated that we don't take in the whole world. We can't. We'll be overwhelmed by its complexity. So we look at the world in basically three, three basic terms. What is my way? What will come in my way? And what will help me along my way? These are the three basic things that we look at. So, if say, you go to office and you are working with a particular colleague, now that colleague might have that whole personal life story. Now, if you develop a personal relationship with them, you might want to know about it. Otherwise, okay, what my job is here, what, what is this colleague meant to do with which they can help me? And what is it that if they don't do it in trouble? So this is how we basically look at the world. And this is a functional reduction of the world. 
As I said, the world is very complicated. But we do a functional reduction of the world centered on our purpose. So based on our purpose, what is my purpose? What will help me in my purpose? And what will hinder me in my purpose? And this is knowledge of what matters. So there is knowledge of matter and knowledge of what matters. And when we look at the world, we focus on knowledge of what matters to us. However, here it's vital that our purpose be positive, be healthy. So if Dhritarashtra's purpose is, I want to become the king, then for him, throughout his life, there is nothing but frustration. Because he just, at that time, now we could say there is a, in the government there is a separation between the politicians and the military. So many times the politicians just uh, sit in their air conditioned armchairs and give, our, give orders for the soldiers to go and fight. <clears throat> I was at a retreat of several Americans recently. They had come to India and they had taken them around. So one of them was a uh, <clears throat> American um, soldier who had retired because of injury. That's all, the, the soldiers were telling us that actually now many of the wars which America gets into, there is no real American interest to it. But just the politicians want it. Now because through that they can make, make arms sales and they can get a lot of money. So but the point I'm making over here is that today the politicians might not have any great physical prowess. Because they are not on the ground fighting. The military has to have physical weapons. But at those times, the king was also a practical fighter, leading the army from the front. So because of that, for him, for Dhritarashtra, there was no way he could become the king. Sometimes in Bollywood movies, you might see a blind person also fighting. Now, the, and that is just, uh, okay. It's good for entertainment, but it's a crippling limitation. It doesn't work so easily in real life. So if there's a limitation, it's a limitation. But what happened, if we decide a particular purpose for our life, then our vision shrinks around that purpose. And that's required at one level, because we need to function. But if that purpose itself is not attainable, and you could say, why is life so unfair? Why can't a blind person become a king? Why okay, Why was I born blind? Why is the system like that that, but that that a king cannot be a blind person? You could rail against the system. But if that is the system, you have to accept it. If we don't accept it, the only result of that is we end up, or we end up shrinking our vision. Shrinking our vision. And then, say for example, this is the way I want to go and there is an unbreakable wall over there. And all that happens is I keep banging my face, banging my head, banging myself against the wall and the wall doesn't break. Only my fist, fists and my head and my body breaks. So for Dhritarashtra, his vision shrunk like that. He said, I want the king. And the wall is not breaking. Then what do I do? If this wall is not breaking, then I will blow up the whole house. So basically, when we set up a particular goal for our lives, say hey, if we are in a particular job and we want our boss job, but now if the boss is incompetent, the boss may be fired and we might become the boss. But if the boss is very competent and the boss is actually more competent than us, then, if I decide that my happiness will be if I get that boss chair, I may never get it. So, what has happened is, we can't change the situations in our lives sometimes. Not all times, but sometimes, it may not be possible. But then, we, we can change our definition of happiness. Somebody might decide, my definition of happiness is, I want to get, become the boss in my office. My definition of happiness is, I want to earn more money than my brother. Or my definition of happiness is, I want a bigger house than my relative's house. Whatever. Now, we all have certain definitions of happiness. 
which is either we have consciously chosen or they have been unconsciously imposed on us, either way. And then our vision gets shrunk around that. So Dhritarashtra, because he could never accept that, why am I blind? Why can't I become the king? So throughout his life, he was constantly craving, when will I become the king? Why can't I become the king? And Dhritarashtra, in a sense, was not a bad person. He was a weak person. And in general, wherever there is weakness, wickedness is nearby. Weakness is where a person has anger, has lust, has greed. And based on that lust, anger, greed, that person might occasionally do something wrong. That's weakness. But wickedness is where the person is cold-blooded. Weakness is hot-headed. Suddenly you get angry and do something terrible. But wickedness is person cold-bloodedly plans. How can I hurt this person the most? So now this is like a slippery slope. At the top of the slippery slope is weakness. At the bottom of the slippery slope is wickedness. So the Dhrashtra was at the top of that slippery slope. Who was at the bottom? Duryodhana. So Duryodhana, so Dhritarashtra had weakness, Duryodhana had wickedness. So wherever there is weakness, somebody with wickedness will come there and grab that opportunity. So, <clears throat> if somebody cannot face the difficulties of life, they are not internally strong enough. That's weakness. So when something goes wrong, they just become very depressed, very, 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 they are going into self-pity. They start feeling very sorry for themselves. That's weakness. Now everybody will feel like that because life is tough. Sometime or other it will happen. But when there is weakness, say for example, a college student feels, oh, I'm not good enough to get good grades in my exam. All the other students are better than me. Now in colleges, especially in modern colleges today, there's so much pressure that you have to have a partner. Oh, I'm not attractive enough to attract a partner. And then they feel inferior because of that. And then there's weakness and in that college premises, there are people with wickedness. There might be a drug peddler. You're feeling down? Just see this drug. You'll feel good. They take it once, they take it twice, they take it thrice. No, when somebody does drug peddling, you know, they are not selling drugs to the students. They are selling students to the drugs. They are selling students to the drugs. In several universities in America, it's, it's a disaster. It's the American president has declared uh, drug abuse as a national emergency over there. It's there in India also, in some parts, especially Punjab and other places. But it is a serious issue. So whenever there is weakness, there will be somebody with wickedness. Who will want to exploit? Who will want to exploit? So when there is weakness, we need to deal with that weakness in a healthy way. We don't deal with that weakness in a healthy way, then there is somebody with wickedness out to exploit. If somebody is unhappy in a relationship. Now, you have to work to improve the relationship. But if somebody is unhappy, there will be somebody else who will be out there who will tempt you, to allure you to get you to break heaven, destroy the family. So whenever there is weakness, wickedness is not far away. That person may not be wicked, but the wicked person will make a weak person wicked. So this is, a, this is if one doesn't accept the situation that they are in, okay, this is the hand that life has dealt me with, if you don't accept it, then we make things much worse. Weakness, if it is not accepted and worked on, then we succumb to wickedness and everything becomes infinitely worse. And that's what Dhritarashtra's life story is. Now from a person who was, this was blind, he ended up becoming a person who was evil. He had his own daughter-in-law uh, being disrobed in front of him. Any half-decent person will stop that. But he did. He 
was ready to have such monstrous dishonor happening right in front of him. He didn't do anything at all. And eventually the consequence was that all his hundred sons were lost. So when we don't accept our weakness, that weakness combines with wickedness and then everything can be destroyed. And that weakness deprived us of one thing, but we give in to wickedness and then we end up deprived of everything. So Dhritarashtra did not have a kingdom, but he had hundred sons. But eventually what happened, he neither had the kingdom, nor he had hundred sons. He lost everything. So I take this class in three parts. The first part I talked I, I talk here about how the lack of self-acceptance can lead to destruction. That is based on the Dhritarashtra story. In the second part, I'll talk about Vidura and how self-acceptance can lead us on a healthy path. And then the last part, I'll talk about how we can walk on this path of self-acceptance. But after each part, we'll have a short break and we can have some questions. So at this point, are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. When we are weak, uh, how do we come over that weakness uh, in the path of devotion? Man? Is there any solution without devotion? Or we have to okay. take devotion as. Okay, whenever there is a weakness in our life, is devotion the only solution or is there any solution apart from devotion also? See, we don't have to have an exclusive idea of devotion. Devotion doesn't, doesn't just mean coming to a temple and doing some chanting of Hare Krishna. Devotion also means that we redefine our whole life as a way of service. As a way of how can I make things better? In fact, this idea of overcoming weakness is what I'm going to speak in the second part, which is about Vidura. So basically, we can say that bad things happen to everyone. And one question which we all get at some time or the other is, why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah, why do bad things happen to people? That's a question which comes upon everyone of us. Now yes, we can go into philosophy and try to answer this question. But more important from practical purposes, not the question, why do bad things happen to good people? But when bad things happen to good people, what do good people do? When bad things happen to good people, what do good people do? Do they let those bad things make them bad? Or do they choose a path by which they, they try to bring some good out of their bad situation? So let's look at the character of Vidura. So Vidura also, I'll answer that question that you posed because your question was related to the second next part of the class. So now Vidura also had the situation where he could never become the king. Now if we look at um, the history of, uh, of say Islam and how Islam is expanded, the expansion of Islam from the 6th century onwards to now is one of the most dramatic expansions of any political, religious political power across the world. But you see, the history is filled with intrigues, violence, murder, and it is, people feel that, oh, Islamic terrorism is a big problem. Yeah, it is, but the, one of the biggest victims of Islamic terrorism is Islamic Muslim only. In the current conflicts over there, so many people are being killed. The, the point is, I'm not going to analyze Islam over here. The point I'm making is that we see the situation that if you look at the history, that this person becomes a king, and then maybe his nephew or his uncle comes and kills him, and then he becomes a king. And in Islamic history, soon after Muhammad itself, the next several caliphs, one of them after another were killed. And then this person, every person died, not dead naturally, but was murdered. So here what is happening, that when somebody finds that I want to be the king, I can't be the king, then 
they start going on a murder spot. And this is not just in Islam, that's recent history, so I'll just give that example. But it, all, it can happen anywhere. And you could say Duryodhana also chose that path. If somebody if I can't somebody can't become the, if I can't become the king, who is in my way and destroy it. And Krishna talks about this in the demoniac mentality. He says, Asaumaya Atahishatru Hanishe Chaparanapi Ishvaro Amam Bhogi Siddho Ambal Vansukhi he says, This enemy I've killed. And that enemy I'll eliminate. And once I eliminate, then I will become the supreme controller. So that mentality, that is the path of Vitarashtra or the path of Dhuru. But Vidura did not go on that path. He did not take, oh I can't, who says I can't be the king? Whoever says that, I will eliminate them. He did not choose that path. He accepted. So life has given us certain cards. Now with the cards that we have, what is the best game that we can play? So Vidura, right from his early childhood, he was recognized for his wisdom. Some children, right from the childhood itself, you can make out some characteristics. Some children are quite studious. Some children, when they, all children cry. But some babies, when they cry, it's like they bring the house down by their crying. Even when they are in their crutches, even when they are in their crutches, they are lying down and thinking, when I going to take the house over. <laughs> it's not necessarily in a negative sense. They have that zeal to, they, you could say they have the Kshatriya power. You know, so, so, he, Vidura Kakana is right from his childhood that I, that he had wisdom. So, rather than saying, why can't I become the king? He groomed himself for the role of an advisor. He, now, somebody will say that actually the role of advisor is for the Brahmanas, that is not for the Kshatriyas. I am Kshatriya. He is not exactly a Kshatriya, some people could have argued about it. But rather than resenting that situation, he accepted. And he groomed himself accordingly. And soon, he was, although he was very young, the Bhishma was the level of the father of Dhritarashtra. And that means he was also the level of father of Vidura. But Vidura became so expert that even Bhishma would listen to the advice of Vidura. And he became an indispensable part of the ruling team. After Pandu retired, and Dhritarashtra became like the caretaker king. Because none of them had children till then. So then Dhritarashtra was on the side of the throne, but Bhishma took care of all the Kshatriya aspect of ruling fighting and subjugating the screens. And Vidura took care of all the Brahminic aspects. That means administering justice, hearing the cases of people and uh, resolving issues. And Vidura gained a lot of influence just by that. So what would Vidura do basically? So normally if somebody is, at least in traditional society, if somebody is born in a particular family, you could say that their birth to, some, to a large extent, determine the trajectory of their life. If you are born in the Brahmana family, you grow up to be a Brahmana. Not that everybody had to, but more or less, that was the culture, that was the upbringing, that was the training, and it would be easy for people to become Brahmanas. So their life trajectory was charted out. But now he realized that if somebody is born in Kshatriya family, the life trajectory is that I become a Kshatriya guru. But that path is not working. So like I have these hands, and with these hands, I cannot be a winner over here. So then, change your vision. Okay, what can I do with what I have? Sometimes you may feel in my life, all the doors are closed. My life is so terrible. Oh, this person doesn't understand me. This person doesn't care for me. This situation is so terrible. This is like this. Sometimes we feel like all the doors in our life are just closed. Now at that time, if we feel like the whole game of life is stacked up against us, now we, one thing we could do is, oh, life is itself not worth living. And then, this is a thought which is straying very close to suicide. Life itself is not worth living. Or that thought can go even worse. 
not only is my life worth not living, now if my life is so unhappy, what right does anyone else have to be happy? So then that is not the suicide that can go towards genocide. You can then go towards homicide where you kill one person, genocide is where you kill hundreds and thousands of people. So many of these people who become like mass killers. Now one one problem with them, it is again it's complex and we can't generalize, but they have let resentment take over their life so much that if I can't get what I want, then whoever has what I want, they don't deserve to live. And that's why alcohol kill indiscriminately. There are people who are terrorists. You just, you just go and kill innocent people. Now what are those innocent people? And what if those people done anything to harm them? But their idea is that you are the whole part of the system that is depriving me of what I want in my life. And therefore I will destroy you. This is a very dark way of thinking. So instead of thinking in this way, if I if the game of life seems to be stacked against me, then instead of thinking that my life is not worth living, or nobody deserves to be happy, nobody deserves to live a happy life. Instead of that, we can think, okay, maybe with the hand I have, this is not the game I should be playing. Maybe I need to change the purpose of my life. Maybe I need to change the definition of my life. You remember I said earlier, we don't see the world in its totality. We see the we see what matters to us. And what matters to us is determined by our purpose. So for a, when we are pursuing a particular purpose, then maybe it seems all the doors are closed and we feel life is so unfair. But if we just change the purpose. So Vidura decided that I can't become the king. So for that the odds are completely stacked against me. That's not going to work. So then we just change the purpose. And if we change the purpose, if we change, we use the hands that we have and start playing the game accordingly, not resenting the hands but accepting the hands, we may find that there are opportunities which are still there. So if I want to go this way, it is a wall and it's an unbreakable wall. I, instead of banging my head and my body against that wall, do I really need to go this way? What if I go this way? Oh, here there's a door. The door open. Oh, I can open it. So what happens? The same situation in which we feel all the doors are closed. If we just accept that situation, then that acceptance can enable us to start finding a better way, better way of it. It's not that the bad thing that have happened, the bad hand that I've got, is suddenly going to change. But in any situation that we are in, if it's a difficult situation, it's a terrible situation, if we are resentful and try to beat against the situation, we only hurt ourselves. But if we accept this is the situation I am in, now what is the best I can do about it? Maybe we readjust our purpose, try to look for some other path. And a door will open for us. A door which we hadn't even noticed will be there for us. It will emerge and it will open. And a path will be shown for us. So, because we don't look at the world in its completeness, the way we see the world is based on our vision. And this, so, the way we see the world is based on our purpose. If we change our purpose, basically we change our world by that. Because our world is not the whole world. Our world is a reduction of the actual world based on what is our way, what will get us along the way, and what will get in our way. Now, A, I change my purpose. Okay, then this way is not okay. Okay, this is my way. And what will get me along the way? And what will get in my way? Can I remove it? Maybe this path, the obstacles are not removable. But this path, the obstacles are removable. So, even when things are wrong for us, things are bad for us, it's not the end of life. It's not, it doesn't have to be the end of life. Except the situation. 
accept as a chinchi. Accept doesn't mean we are passive. It doesn't mean we just you know, we say, oh, life is so unfair, I can't change anything, this is the way I am, and my, this is my destiny. No. Within that situation that you are put, you see what is the best that you can do. And once you start seeing what is the best you can do, you'll find that there's a lot of power that you still have. So Vidura used that power. Now Dhritarashtra did not accept his advice. And that was Dhritarashtra's loss. Yudhishthir recognized the virtue of virtuousness of Vidura. And Vidura used his he was not only just virtuous, but he was also shrewd. He understood the way real politics worked. And he protected the Pandavas. <coughs> he protected the Pandavas from the many dangers that they faced. In fact, uh, Yudhishthira says later on, Oh, Vidura, you protected us the way a bird protects its baby birds. Although we had no father, you acted like our father. And you protected us from many dangers. So Vidura did what he could in that situation, which he was in. And eventually, when Dhritarashtra lost everything, that was the time Dhritarashtra had no one. But still he had Vidura. The same Vidura whom he had rebuffed, whom he had neglected, whose insight by Duryodhana, Duryodhana he had not stopped. The same Vidura came to his rescue. So, although you could say comparatively speaking, Dhritarashtra had much more royal privilege than what Vidura had. But because Vidura played his hands well, not only did Vidura create a bright chart for his life, he also, at the end of his life of Dhritarashtra, brightened that life. He ensured that Dhritarashtra's life did not have an inauspicious end the way Duryodhana's life had ended. So even if our situation is dark, you know, not only can we do well within that situation, but even those who have a better situation than us, we may be able to help them also. So this acceptance self-acceptance and acceptance in the situation around us, that helps us to wield power within the situation that we are in. Many people today, they think power means the power to change the situation. And if you don't have that power, it's become very resentful. Very resentful. So, Many people, especially in the Western world, in the Westernized world, have this idea that actually throughout history, men were in power and men exploited women. And now women are rising and we will not allow men to exploit them anymore. Now, this is a, such a uh, uh, distorted view of history. It is not, yes, there have been cases where men have abused women, no doubt about it. But then there are also cases that the men who used to work in, work in various places, they were abused by their master. The world is an abusive place. And everybody gets a bad deal. And the important point over here is that so, so, some people, I was giving a class in a university in America, and I was talking about history, I was making this point, and then one girl walked up. He said, why do you word that, use the word history? I said, what's wrong with the word history? I said, history is his story. It should not be his story. It should be her story. <laughs> I said, I don't even know whether whoever coined the word history had his story in mind. <laughs> it is a name for a subject. <laughs> well, everybody, if you see, every life was tough for everyone. And... Uh, Different people in their different situations get into trouble. And everybody has to deal with the trouble. Why I'm giving this example is today, especially in today's world, if people think that if I'm in a difficult situation, I just want to end this, avoid this relationship, get out of it, and just put an end to it and move on with my life. That's my power. But, no, 
that, that's not the only way to accept poverty. You accept the situation and then work within that situation. And there's a lot of power that can be exerted within the situation also. Sometimes when we reject a situation, so rejecting situations is very easy. But what is the consequence of that? So a lot of complication that comes from that also. So acceptance doesn't mean that we have to accept, uh, accept uh, being victimized by others, others being... Uh, there is a limit to acceptance also. The Pandavas did not just accept everything the Kauravas did. When a particular limit was crossed, the Pandavas fought against them. But the point here is that we shouldn't think of power means, oh, this is a bad situation, I won't accept the situation, I'm just going to fight against this. There are sometimes some situations, the fighting against those situations is almost impossible. Or fighting against those situations takes so much energy that then you have nothing left to do. You have no energy left to do anything else after that. Okay, accept the situation and work within that situation. And when you work within that situation, you discover that you are not as powerless as you thought you were. There are things we can do even within the situation that we are in. So, Vidura, as I said, created a brighter trajectory for his life. So much so that he even brightened the path of life of someone who had created a dark trajectory for himself. It was the Rajshri. So this is the second point I was going to speak about. How Vidura, what he did was, he changed the purpose of his life. And then he found doors only. He couldn't become the king, but he had the natural abilities to become a sage, a Rajanvishya. And that he became in a sweet way. So, I'll complete the third point and then we can have questions in the end. Now, what, what does this all mean for us in our particular situations? Basically, when we talk about acceptance, there are, uh, there are two ways of looking at it. One is to say that everything is everything is perfect the way it is. And other way is everything is lousy. Everything is terrible. Reality is never in the shades of black and white. It's always in various shades of grey. So some people, especially some psychologists, people have low self-esteem and then they say, oh, you know, whatever the world says, you are perfect the way you are. Well, I don't know if there's anyone in the world who can say I am perfect the way I am. All of us have crippling deficiencies and all of us have many areas in which we can work and improve. So, self-acceptance should open the door to self-transformation, not close the door. Self-acceptance means this is where I am and I accept where I am. But after I accept, then I hope to change myself. So, say there is, there is who we are presently and then there is who we are potential. So, if you, if you tell someone you are perfect the way you are right now, then, then what we are doing is who they are potentially, we don't allow that to manifest. So, really respect for a person is not just I respect you for whoever you are. Yes, that's good. But I respect you for who you are presently. But I also respect you for who you are potentially. And from what you are presently, you should go to what you are potentially. And that is the whole idea of Parenting. Parenting means parents love their children as they are presently. But the parents also see what my child can be potential. And parents try to mold their life in such a way that the child who is there presently can become who they can be potential. And that applies to us also. So self-acceptance doesn't mean passivity. It means intelligently direct activity. Okay, this is where I am. How can I move forward from here? How can I move forward from here? And for this, now spiritual life or the principles of bhakti yoga can
it will vary and operate. Why? Because at one level, we understand that whatever situation we are in, it might be because of this, this thing, okay, you know, I am like this because I was born in this family, because my parents were like this, my neighbors were like this, my, the locality in which I was born was like this. But beyond all these circumstantial factors, there is a transcendent. The way we are presently, ultimately, it is under Krishna's power. And from wherever we are presently, if we let Krishna mold our lives, then Krishna can make us who we can be potentially. So when we practice bhakti, bhakti has two aspects to it. One is transcending, the other is transforming. Transcending means, okay, the situation, situation you are in, just raise your consciousness above the situation and connect with Krishna. Oh, you have the you have this problem, you have this issue, that issue doesn't matter. Just connect with Krishna. That is transcending the situation. And we all need to do that. Say, for example, when we come to the temple and we just absorb ourselves in Krishna Kirtan, Krishna Katha, when we do our japa, these are the times when we are transcending our situation. Along with transcending our situation, we also can and should work to transform. Transform ourselves, transform our situation. But, and Bhakti has both these aspects. So, Krishna, for example, in 4, 7, and 8 in the Bhagavad Gita, the famous verses, Paritranaya Sadhuna, Vinashaya Chitushkrita, Dharma Samstapana Arthaya, Sambhava Piyuke Yuke. So, now this is world transformation. Those who are wicked people in power, Krishna says, I want to eliminate them. And those who are virtuous, I am going to enthrone them. And in this way, I am going to establish them. This is world transformation. But 4 9, the words immediately after that is Janma Karma Chave Devya, Eva Yoveti Katvataha, Yaktwa Deva, Punar Janma, Naiti Mame So Krishna says over there that those who become absorbed, no meaning true that become absorbed with me. They will rise beyond this world of distress and death. They will attain me. This is transcending the world. So for all of us, both these aspects are there. So now when we have certain weaknesses, if we just repeatedly define ourselves by the weakness, oh I am like this, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. We self-identify with our weakness, then that only disempowers us and fills us with bitter, bitterness and resentment. Okay, this is the way I am. However I am, Krishna still loves me. I am still a part of Krishna. Krishna is still present in my heart. Let me connect with him from wherever I am. That is the aspect of transcending the situation. But once we connect with Krishna, and then we get strength by that connection with Krishna, then Krishna says, Desham Sarata Yukana, Vajitam Preetapurvaro, Dharami Buddhi Yogamta, so Krishna says, Dadami Bhutti Yogamta. If we do bhakti, Preeti Purvaka, if we do it affectionately, if we affectionately serve Krishna, then He will give us the intelligence by which we can make wise choices. Okay, so any situation that we are in, let's connect with Krishna, let's pray to Krishna. And then, okay, what is the best way I can act in this situation? Sometimes we feel that this situation is so terrible that I just can't do anything in this situation. I am just powerless. Have any of you felt like that? That I am in a situation that there is nothing I can do in this situation. I am completely powerless. Any of you have felt like that? Yes. Many of you have felt. Those of you who have not felt, you will feel soon in future. <laughs> I am not saying this in a, making a negative prediction for you. But that's just the way your life is, unfortunately. So we all feel powerless at times. Now when we feel powerless, there is one, one way in which we can challenge this uh, idea of, oh, I just can't do anything about this. One thought exercise. What is that thought exercise? Okay, so no matter how bad things are, can I make them worse? 
who wants to make them worse? They are already terrible. No, no, we know, it's not that we should make them worse, but it's just an exercise. No matter, thought exercise. No matter how bad things are, we are never so powerless that we can't make a bad thing worse. Is it? Say, if I get a fracture and I am mobilized, immobilized, six months, six weeks I am in a fracture. I mean, uh, my hand, my foot is in a, my leg is in a cast and I am in a bed. That's a miserable situation. I may say I am powerless. But, you know, even in that situation, I can take a hammer and crack my other knee. <laughs> now, obviously we shouldn't do that. <laughs> but the point is, we are never so powerless that we can't make a bad situation worse. And what this means is, if we can make a bad situation worse, that means we are not as powerless as we think. If we can make things worse, then we can make them better also. We can make them better also. Sometimes some people fall sick and then they are on that sick, they are on the bed, but they have become so irritable, so disagreeable that they are sick and their caregivers become sick of them. <laughs> oh my God. If, yes, you are sick and it's, un it's terrible. It's, it's no beginning to be sick. But you, even in that sickness, there are people who are graceful, there are people who are calm, who accept the situation. So no situation is so bad that we, it makes us completely powerless. We all have some little power in this situation. If we can make a bad situation worse, then we can make it better also. And if we just decide this, resolve, make this intention, that okay, in this situation, this is a terrible situation, uh, how can I act in the best possible way in this situation? If we just make this decision, then we'll find our world will change. What do you mean? How will the world change? The world is the same. But as I told you earlier, our world, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world reduced according to what matters to us. So, if my purpose is, okay, this is a terrible situation, I mean, I accept it. But how can I make this better? How can I act in the best possible way in this situation? As soon as we make that intention, we'll find there are opportunities. Oh, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. No, I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed, I'm irritable. But anyway, for the next one hour, I will not snap at anyone. I will not be rude to anyone. I will speak politely. And if you smile at someone and you talk politely, and they talk politely, and they smile back at you, you feel good. Oh, then after one, you just. If you think for the next life, my, the rest of my life I will be polite. And then at the next provocation, we will say, our mind will say, you will leave politeness for the rest of your life. <laughs> we'll snap and be rude at that time. So, when things are tough, don't think of the rest of your life. Just reduce your working frame to a very short limit. As for the next one hour, can I be the best that I can be? And yes, for one hour I can and do your best for one hour and then at the end of that one hour appreciate yourself. Good job. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Krishna, for giving this strength to do what I want. And then let's look at the next one hour as another unit. So if we work, work in this way, we'll find that even in the darkest of situations, we can find light and we can create a better situation for ourselves. And if we can create, be a source of light for ourselves and others in dark situations also. And those dark situations are not going to stay forever. They are going to end. And when they end, we will have become tougher, we will have become stronger, we will have become wiser. We will have come closer to Krishna in those situations. So both these aspects, transcending and transforming, they can they work on the foundation of self-acceptance. This is a situation I am in, I accept it. It's not a good situation, in fact it's a terrible situation, I don't deny it. But this is the hand that I have. What is the best way I can deal with it? Let me just 
pray to Krishna, rise above that situation. And then when I rise above that situation, then my vision is not restricted to what I wanted to do. I can, when I rise above the situation, then I can look at the situation from a different perspective. Okay, from here, this path is blocked. If I've risen above it, oh, from here, this path is not that blocked. I can move this way. So we'll find that door also to open. And Krishna will empower us to walk through those doors. And we will discover that the difficult situations that we were in, they at one time might seem like to like a dungeon for us in which we are trapped. But in due course we discover that the situation was not a dungeon, but it was a tunnel. And we walk through it, we come to the end of the tunnel, and we see that is light at the end of the tunnel. So I summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this topic of self-acceptance and the power of accept self-acceptance. I started by talking about how <clears throat> life is like a card game and we all get a bad hand at times or there's something bad about the hand that everyone gets. So, but what is in our hand is how we play with the hand that we already have. So we talked about how Vidura and Dhritarashtra, both of them have a bad hand. Dhritarashtra was blind, Vidura was low born. Now what happened for Dhritarashtra, he kept craving and craving for the kingdom. That was just impossible for him to get because of his kingdom, because of his blindness. And that craving shrunk his vision. So to have desires and ambitions is not wrong. But when our desires make us go beyond dharma, that is when it becomes terribly wrong. So I talked about when we look at the world, we don't look at the world in totality. We, we look at we take in a functional, functionally reduced picture of the world, which is based on primarily three things: not knowledge of matter, but knowledge of what matters. Not how many chairs are there in this room, but is there a chair for me? That means, what do we look at? What is my way? What will get in my way? And what will get me along my way? So, the Trashtra was not a, was he had the weakness of a constant craving for the kingdom. But wherever there is weakness, there is somebody with wickedness who will exploit that weakness. And that will, that will make a weak person a wicked person. Or at least make a weak person act in wicked ways. I think there are students who can't cope with the pressures of college life and there are drug peddlers. They don't sell drugs to the students, they sell the students to the drugs. They ruin lives. So we need, so what Dhritarashtra did was he became so despotic, so evil that he was openly watching in glee, waiting for his own daughter in law to be stroked. So what happened? He, he, in the dark situation, he let resentment make him even darker. So when somebody becomes resentful, they think life is not worth living. And they go towards suicide. Or they think, if my life is not worth living, how dare anyone else have a life worth living? And then they go towards homicide or genocide. These are very dark areas to go towards. Vidura chose a different trajectory. He recognized that he couldn't become the king, so he readjusted his goal. This is so let me become an advisor to the king. And when he readjusted his goal, he found that the door was open for him. He had natural natural intelligence by which he could become uh, such a virtuous and wise person that he even Bhishma took advice from him. And so much so that Dhritarashtra, whose life had become dark by his own dark choices, Vidura brought light into that, that dark light toward the end of his life. So we all can, by accepting the situation that we are in, ensure that our life doesn't become like Dhritarashtra's, but become like Vidura's. And for that, I talked about three broad principles toward the end. First was that just when we find that the game of life is stacked against us, then just see if you can change your goal. And then you'll find that door is open. So don't let your definition of happiness 
deprive you of happiness. If I can't be my, you can't get the position of my boss. Okay, what can I get? So change your purpose. And for that, I talk about how bhakti can enable us to transcend the situation and then transform the situation. When we transcend, we rise above the situation, and then we realize this is not the only path I have to follow. I don't have to beat against a wall that can't be broken. This is also path. And then we raise our consciousness by connecting with Krishna. Then Krishna gives the intelligence to find out how to take steps forward, which path to follow. And when we are in a bad situation where we feel powerless, then by no the third point was that if we can make things worse, we can also make them better. So just take reduce the working frame to small manageable units. So the next one hour, can I be the best that I can? Can I take this one step forward? And if we do that. Keep just taking one step, one step forward. Eventually, we find that the dark phase that we were going through was not a dungeon in which we were trapped, but it was a tunnel. And we will come to the light at the end of the tunnel, having become wiser, stronger, and tougher. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, any questions or comments? Uh, Prabhu, you said uh, weakness, the uh, weakness is there, wickedness is around. And the wickedness uh, exploits the weakness and rules a person's life. So, if I have weakness, how do I identify the wicked person around? So that I may stay in weakness and try to get above, at least I would not be exploited by the wicked person. Okay, how we identify who is the wicked person around us if we have weakness? So basically, those who, you can say thank you, those who draw out, the those who fan and fuel the dark desires within us. So we have lust, we have anger, we have greed. Somebody who just fans and fuels it. We can say that. If the effect of that person, associating with that person is that I start feeling more angry, more resentful, more greedy, more or maybe more depressed. See, anger expressed outward is aggression. Anger directed inward is depression. When I am so angry with myself, why am I not good enough? Why can't I do this? Why don't I look good enough? Why can't I speak fluently enough? Why, can't I, why don't I have a good enough memory? Why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? The anger directed inward leads to depression. So, whenever we interact with people, especially people either who, people with whom we interact regularly or people who influence us a lot, then after our interaction we can, with them, we can observe what is the effect on our consciousness. Is it that our resentment increases, our negativity increases? Our la our so if the weaknesses within us are increasing and we start getting more and more darker ideas about how to act on those weaknesses, then we can understand that that person is a wicked person who is drawing out the weakness within us. So in the, in the Ramayana, uh, Kai Kai Kaushalya and Sumitra, they were living reasonably happy. They were co-wives, so naturally there was some tension between them. But it was the same acceptable level of tension that is there in any family. But who, who acted in a wicked way over there? Mantara. And then Kai Kai ended up in something wicked. So she had some, some insecurity. How many Kai Kai will assert my position? But then, when Mantara started exploiting that. So we basically see, look at the effect on our consciousness in terms of our desires and our emotions of people's association based on that we can understand. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, that's a question. Yeah. 
Well, gee, as you said, the, um, in this last question, we can identify the weekend person. But uh, in the age of Kali, means uh, both weekend person and good person are within us only. So, if we did identify someone as weekend person, then we will be very angry upon him. So, means, uh, isn't it that uh, our mind is the weakest, uh, most weakest one? Means, uh, outside, uh, we should not see anyone weaker. Okay, it's a good question. Isn't it that ultimately the wicked person is also inside us, or the good and bad side that are inside us? If we see somebody as, identify somebody as wicked, then we will become angry with them. Well, <coughs> that's true. Let's put it this way that <coughs> whenever any dark desire arises within us, so there is an impression and there is a provocation. Say for example, somebody has the urge to drink. Say somebody's their home is over here and their workplace is over here and in between there is a bar. Now there are two people staying over here and one of them has never drunk and has no interest in drinking. When they pass by, when they pass by, they don't even notice the bar over there. Because there is no impression within them, so there is no provocation caused by that. But somebody who is drunk regularly, then, because that impression is there, as soon as they pass by the bar, they drink. You know, I have a lot of work to do, I can't drink today. No, no, if you drink, you will be more relaxed, you will work better. No, no, last time I did that and I couldn't work at all. No, 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 last time you drank too much, now can drink a little more. So, you know, this whole tug of war will go on with it. So, now, why in that, you could say, is the bar the cause of the desire for alcohol? Well, yes and no. The bar doesn't trigger the desire in the person who has never drunk because there is no impression. So if there is no impression within, the external will not cause the provocation. But if we know that the impression is there within, now we can't eradicate the impression very quickly. That will require purification that takes one time. So then during that time, we need to avoid the provocation. So when we say somebody is a wicked person, it's right, we don't want to label people as wicked. But we could say that, okay, this person, the effect of this person's association on me is negative. So we could say maybe the dark side within me gets activated because of this person. So then, I'm not saying this person is bad, but it is more that the effect of this person's association on is bad for me. And then we need to keep it Sometimes even the temple, we may come and there are some devotees whose association inspires us and enthuses us to serve Krishna only. Some devotees will come to the temple and he is complaining about it. Prasad is not good, the puja is dressing, the dressing is not done properly, the kirtan is out of tune, the management is like this, this is like that. And they are constantly complaining. Now yes, there may be things are wrong and they need to be fixed. But if we don't have the power to change that and they don't have the power to change that, then talking about it may not be very useful. So if we can talk with somebody who can fix things and helpful, but otherwise just talking about it, how is it really helping? How is it enhancing Krishna consciousness? So then we may decide, you know, okay, uh, I can't do anything about this right now and I don't want to get involved in this. So I'm not associated with this person. So we're not saying that devotee is a bad devotee. They're also devotees. But the effect of their association on us is not devotional for us. So, we do acknowledge that it is not that people make us bad, there is something bad within us which may be triggered by the association of some people. Now, sometimes they may themselves be malicious and they deliberately want to bring the bad out of us. Or sometimes they are not malicious, but somehow circumstances are such that they, their association brings the bad out of us. So, if that is happening, then we need to guard ourselves. Does that answer your question? Yes, the question. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for wonderful class. I just have one doubt regarding uh, bad hand will come to everyone because we are having a material and future and uh, both it will come out only material terms or it will come in bad hand to everyone. Uh, you said that everyone will get a bad hand. Uh, so, 
Um, uh, as a devotees, we will uh, material life and spiritual life both are there. And is it come only bad hat for material things or is it come with the spiritual also? Okay, so and we say get a bad hand. We might be get a bad hand in the spiritual life also. Well, it depends on how you define a bad hand. But suppose, say we we grew up in our devotional life in a particular community. We are introduced, and we we grew up when we bonded very nicely with those devotees, and we grew up over there. And then somehow afterwards, maybe our job, our family required us to go somewhere else. And then we go to some other community, and maybe that community is a very has a very different mood, and then we are not able to bond with that mood. Maybe we are in a community where there is a lot of emphasis on distribution preaching. Somebody else we go, somewhere else we go, and then the emphasis is primarily on deity worship or building a new temple. Then we may not be able to gel with that. So you could say that comparatively speaking, that was a better situation for me than this situation. So we could call it a bad hand. In some ways, uh, but we might find that sometimes when we go to a community different from where we were trained, instead of just criticizing this community doesn't have that mood or this mood, we can say maybe we, it is an opportunity for us to broaden our conception of bhakti. That bhakti can be practiced in this way. People who are doing this are also practicing bhakti in there. Maybe they are not exactly practicing the same way I am practicing. Maybe not the same level of seriousness or whatever. It's a different. But that's also we can see that. But it is true that even in devotional life, we all can, we all do have our particular preferences. Say so we may like to hear the classes of a particular devotee. We may we have a particular relationship, close relationship with particular duties. We may like to go to a particular dham. These are all preferences. And if what we feel naturally connected to in bhakti. We get more and more opportunity to do that. We can say that's a good hand. And if circumstantially we are put away from those situations, we can say that's a bad hand. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the opportunity for bhakti is lost for us. All that is there. The opportunity to practice bhakti in a particular way may be lost for us. Then, then we can try to practice bhakti in whatever we can in that situation. And even if we maintain the desire. Krishna, that was so wonderful. It was so nice if I could do that. If I could go to this town, if I could associate with this devotee, if I could do this service. Then even that longing will purify us. Even that longing will help us move closer to Krishna. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as I put the question before, this is the uh, question I'm asking you that uh, in this particular world there are many wicked this against your weakness. So to cope up with them, uh, everybody is jealous of everyone. It's, it may be your brother, it may be your friend or it may be your neighbor. So how do we uh, understand that this person is uh, wicked or, uh, and he is stamping on, on my weakness and uh, how should I get, get out from that? Okay. If you understand that everybody is in my and jealous of everyone else. So how do we understand that this person is wicked and, and how do we get out of that situation like this? See, it's not that simple. Actually, everybody, you could say at one level, uh, is like a monkey with snakes around them. That means we all have a mind which is like a monkey restless, but it's not just like a monkey which is restless, it's also like a snake. There are many snake like desires which are vicious. And if we are naive, naive means the naive way of looking at the world is everyone is a good person. If we are naive, we will be terribly hurt. Because people will betray us. We will be and we will be we will be set up for disaster. So we cannot live naive in the world. But the, the, the naive is one extreme. The other extreme of the pendulum is to go towards skepticism and cynicism. 
and everybody is a bad person. There was one atheistic philosopher who asked, do you believe in hell? And people, uh, when they were asked, they thought he would say, obviously say no, because they didn't believe in God. He says, no, of course I believe in hell. What is hell according to you? Is hell means other people. <laughs> so, such a terrible, dark way of looking at things. So this is, if we start thinking everybody is a bad person, so we will become paranoid. We can't live. So in between the extremities of naivety and cynicism is the courage to trust. That means I understand that there are many snakes inside me and there are many snakes inside me. But still I trust that you will not let those snakes, snakes come out of you and bite you. And I will not let the snakes inside me come out and bite you. Now that has, trust has to be based on intelligence. And sometimes we may go wrong. But generally if we trust, if you use our reasonable intelligence and trust, that trust also inspires others to bring out their best self. And it is through, through responsible relationships where we each bring out the higher side with other things. So now, with respect to some people who we see that they are wicked or they, they do seem to speak negatively about us, hurt us, backbite against us, then we have to do what is required to protect ourselves. But the wicked person never attack unless you are with all the weakness around you and you cannot do anything, there's a wall in front of us and you cannot break that wall. It's like that. And then you understand, you really realize that, yeah, this is something we get going on. But uh, from the beginning till the end, you cannot recognize them that he is wicked. That's, that's the way life is. Yeah. We, life doesn't never come with the guarantee of right decisions. So we all make decisions. Sometimes we make the decisions right. Sometimes we make the right decisions. And sometimes we make the decisions right. And I took this decision. Now what is the best I can make of this situation? So yeah, it's that uh, if, uh, if there could be a way in which we could look into the heart of anyone before we formed a relationship with them, we might think that you know, then I can safely form relationships. But you know, if we could look into others' hearts, then others could look into our hearts also. And then nobody will want to form a relationship with us. Isn't it? We all also have dark side in us. So, in that sense, there is a certain element of risk. And that's why, along with the horizontal relationship that we have with others, we need the shelter of the vertical relationship. So, it is, when I am relating with someone, I am not just relating with that person. I am trusting Krishna, Using the intelligence given by Krishna, seeing this person also the part of Krishna, mm -hmm. I act in a mode of service. And sometimes, when we act responsibly, when we act in a kind, respectful, responsible way, the other person also responds in a kind, respectful, and responsible way. And then the relationship grows. But if the other person doesn't respond like that, then we have to be intelligent and say that, okay, this particular thing is not working. Then that doesn't mean I reject it. But then I have to create some safety barriers that I protect myself. But that doesn't mean whatever I did in that relationship was simply a waste. If I was doing this as a number of service to Krishna, that I'm relating with this person, but I'm relating, this relationship is also a way which I'm serving Krishna. Then we will spiritually evolve. We will grow to that relationship. Even if we don't grow in that relationship. We may not, that relationship may not grow, but we will grow through that relationship. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Krishna Prabhupada Ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki, Gaur Premande.